Good afternoon. Happy Tuesday. Hope everybody's having a fantastic day. Um, today, we're back here again um, with Matt Crumbly. Hi, Matt. Hi, Julie. Matt um, gives us an awesome um, webinar every Tuesday on some type of legal um, problem or, you know, we've gone through our patent series, our trademark series, our copyright series. And now last week we started the accessibility series. And today he's going to be talking about accessibility offline. And that's how the ADA affects your brick and mortar business. So I'm sure there's a lot in here. We don't know what we don't know um, that you can all benefit from. So take it away, Matt. All right, Julie. So, um, as Julie mentioned, my name is Matt Grumbling. I'm with NTIP Patent and Trademark Law. Uh, you can see our, our website up here, www.ntiplaw.com. Uh, here's my email, matt at ntiplaw.com. And uh, my cell number here, which I'll let you read for yourself. Uh, feel free to, to contact me if you have any questions. And also, we're coming to the end of the series, and we don't really have any any topics lined up for the next series. So if you have anything you'd like to hear about uh, legal issues that you're facing as as a uh, as a startup, as a especially as a tech startup, but but really any any sort of um, startup or or even any any small business will do. Um, just you know, drop me a line, shoot me a, a text, or or you know, give me a call on my cell phone. And I'll be uh, I'll be glad to respond to that. Um, so I'm, I'm going to be talking today. I, I, I've titled this accessibility offline. That's in contrast to online accessibility issues, which I'll I'll talk about in two weeks after the spring break. Um, and, and I'm going to talk about uh, how the ADA applies to brick and mortar businesses. This is sort of the the um, traditional way that the uh, Americans with Disabilities Act uh, was interpreted by the the, de uh, the Department of Justice and the other uh, agencies that have been tasked with enforcing it. Uh, this what what has clearly happened since the beginning of the the Internet age, um, in the, you know, 1990 when the ADA was passed. It, uh, you know, the internet was just starting out and nobody really understood, or, well, some people really understood, but very few people really understood how it would change the way we, uh, we, we purchase uh, goods and services, how we access entertainment, how we communicate in general. And uh, that has really changed the, the way the, um, the ADA has been applied. Um, but it hasn't it hasn't completely supplanted the, uh, the you know the traditional brick and mortar uh, concerns of the ADA. As a matter of fact, even at thirty years of age, the ADA con continues to uh, be applied against uh, against especially service providers, and, um, and and often with you know pretty pretty hefty fines involved. So I'll talk about that a, a bit. Uh, as we go through this, uh, the, the topics I'm going to just broadly speaking, I'll, I'll cover some general considerations, and then I'm going to walk through some of the accessibility requirements. And, and the important thing to, to note here is that um, first off, I've tried I've tried to summarize these. And the the rules themselves are meant to be read by people who are in construction business. Just the way they're defined, I, I can tell that they were written by the same types of people who write um, the, the the standards or the uh, the codes, you know, the building codes. So even for a you know a, a chemist and a lawyer, they're they're a bit uh, opaque <laughs> to, to say the least. So I, I've done my best to kind of summarize them. I've only summarized some of them. They, they're actually quite long, um, and you know they definitely need. They deserve more than you know thirty minutes of uh, treatment. To be honest with you, um, I, I, I'm going to mention now that the ADA 
uh, does apply to existing structures, but a little bit differently than, uh, and by existing structures, I mean those that were in place at, at the ADA's inception, which is 30 years ago. So, you know, as, as buildings age and are replaced, there are fewer and fewer buildings that uh, should fit into that category. And there should be more and more uh, proportionally those that are uh, new structures. All new structures are expected to comply not only with the ADA, but also with, uh, with state and local requirements that are often uh, uh, even more stringent than, uh, than the ADA itself. So the ADA, you should always think of as being a baseline and you should always look to local codes and uh, and you know and uh, and state requirements as well if they happen to be a little bit more strict if there's a conflict between them if there's a clear conflict i think you could say that uh, the ada would trump but um you should if you if you see that kind of situation and you think that it looks like it's a it, it it's a you know is there a clear collision between the two or one, you know, one can't be true or the, unless the other one's false. Now, I think you should talk to a lawyer about that. Um, so, as I mentioned before, uh, the ADA was a, adopted in 1990. It was meant to be a, uh, a remedial law. It was meant to uh, remedy discrimination. And so it's been interpreted rather broadly by the courts. Um, it applies to public accommodations. It does not apply in your house. It, it maybe maybe for new builds it should, but it does not apply in your house, and so you don't have to worry about that. Um, you only have to worry about it if you're if you run in a, a facility that's open to or used by the public. So you know the standard thing would be a shopping mall, a strip mall, a um, you know any sort of barber shop or a um, you know a, a cos cosmetic. Uh, uh, anyhow, I, I, uh, I'm misspeaking here. Um, let, let me just move on here. Uh, and here we have retail stores, service establishments, educational institutions. Those are big ones. You know, even a private educational institution is a place of public accommodation, and so it, it, it needs to accommodate um, people with disabilities. Uh, rec recreational facilities. Even gyms and things like that need to be uh, need to be in compliance with the ADA. Um, the property owner has to provide access to those areas where goods and services are provided to the public. So, if you have a restaurant, the public parts need to be in compliance with the ADA. Now, it might be smart for you to make the entire area uh, accessible to the public. Well, well in compliance. Uh, even if it's not accessible to the public, um, but what you're required by the ADA to do is bring your those sections that are accessible to the public into compliance. So, you know, the ADA very helpfully um, offers some penalties to uh, <laughs> to steer us in the right direction, and they're kind of hefty. Um, your first fine, if you have fines imposed by the DOJ. Uh, would be seven hundred fifty thousand dollars or yeah, seventy five thousand dollars. I'm sorry, that's a good chunk of change for anybody. Uh, you know, even for a even for a big chain with uh, you know lots and lots of locations, seventy five grand is you know that's a full time employee for a year at least, and it may, might be two depending on what the prevailing wages in the area. So that's that's a lot of money. Um, Repeat violations, you can get hit for double that. And that doesn't count what happens if you get sued, um, especially in a class action lawsuit. You, you know, you can get all sorts of damages and they can be, you know, they, they tend to be punitive in nature and so they tend to be high. Um, and then on top of everything else, uh, you can get hit with the attorney's fees for the plaintiff. So not only do you get to pay your own lawyer to try to get you out of trouble, you get to pay for their attorney as well. So, you know, there are just, there are all sorts of reasons for you to, uh, you know, let's say disincentives to, uh, to violate the ADA. 
if you, you can possibly help it. So the, the difference between new builds and existing structures is that in, an, in existing structures, you are required to remove barriers where that's readily achievable. And what that means, readily achievable means that it's easily accomplishable, able to be carried out without much difficulty or expense. Now, the, if, you, if you're like me, you look at that sentence and you think to yourself, well, that doesn't help me much at all. And, and this is where you, you, know, you need somebody who's experienced either, uh, you know, either an experienced contractor who's worked a lot in compliance or, or a consultant or a, uh, an ADA consultant or, or a lawyer who's experienced in this area. And, it, and I would say that um, if you were to contact me about this, I would immediately rope in a, uh, a consultant who is experienced in, in working in this area to figure out, well, what do we mean by a you know, barrier that's easily accomplishable? Um, and and I'll, I'll walk through some of the requirements and you'll start to see you know, you, you probably will start to see where, you know, where a, a company could be out of, out of compliance and you kind of imagine in your mind what it might take in, in terms of expense to bring it into compliance. And, you know, so you balance these factors, right? And, you know, the, the company size is gonna make a difference. The, their company's revenues are gonna make a difference. The number of people you normally have through a store in a, in a period of a year might make a difference, you know, that kind of thing. So these are things that have to be balanced out and there, you know, um, and there are guidelines out there that you, you need to follow. But uh, nothing counts as much as experience with this kind of thing. So um, you have to do it where it's readily achievable. You have to remove barriers where readily achievable, even if you weren't planning on doing alterations or renovations. Now, if you are planning on doing alterations or renovations, then you know the requirement to re to remove um, barriers is even higher because there you're already going to spend the money. Then I think the the amount um, the amount of extra that you would have to spend. Uh, is probably marginal compared to if you were not planning on doing these, you know, you would probably, um, you know, the expenses would be higher uh, compared to what you were planning on spending. But in any case, the fact that you are going to remove barriers uh, or the fact that, the, that you're planning on, um, you're not planning on doing alterations or renovations is only one factor. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't, really absolve you of removing barriers where it's readily achievable. Now, what the Department of Justice recommends is that you adopt an implementation plan. This is basically a, a list of areas where maybe your existing structure is out of compliance. If you have a new structure, you should, you know, it should be built without obstructions, ideally. And we'll walk through what some of those might be. But um, but this implementation plan would be in order to remove barriers and in, in an existing structure. And what you're doing is you're sort of triaging what the um, you know what your worst problems are and what your most expensive problems are. Put them in a list of uh, you know kind of worst to you know least obstructive barriers. And, and then put some costs on those things and then prioritize them in terms of achievability so that you can you know, knock them out. And if you, you know, let's say you put, put in place a two-year plan or a five-year plan or something like that and you're, and you're clicking through it, then if somewhere along in that time you're, you're clicking through your list and you're making progress on it and you, you know, DOJ gets a complaint about your business, you can show them the implementation plan where you stand in it, where, you know, how you're making a, uh, you're making a good faith effort to comply with the ADA requirements. If you do these things, then the DOJ is going to be a lot more forgiving toward you. And at least you'll, you know, you maybe avoid that $75,000 hit for, for a violation. Now, 
that may not absolve you of uh, of liability if you get sued, but you you know you can you know, <laughs> believe me dealing with the DOJ it, unfortunately with them you know they're they're kind of worse than a court in a way because they're not going to balance any equities or anything like that they're just going to look at it they're going to kind of look at their their list and go well that that's a you know that's readily achievable on our list so you're going to pay seventy five thousand dollars you don't want that. Um, if you're interested in looking at the requirements, uh, they can be found at this horrendous website, um, or you can just go to ada.gov and follow the links for the, the 2010 standards, the 2010 ADA standards, and, um, and, and you can you know, click over to an HTML that will uh, you know, give you all the standards. We will, I, I'll give Julie a um, PDF copy of this presentation and she can put it up on the website so you can access it. Um, so I'm going to walk you through some some exemplary requirements here. Um, one of the, one of the biggest ones, this one seems to to get an awful lot of uh, activity in terms of lawsuits is wheelchair access. So you need to have wheelchair accessible ramps. Um, entrance ramps should be no more than 8.3% grade. That's one in 12. Uh, no more than 30 inch rise for any ramp run. And parking lots should be no more than 2% grade. So, and if you have any doubts about whether, you know, whether your particular um, structure meets these requirements, uh, you know, you can go out and, you know, get a Get a laser level or something like that, and and check these things out. And by the way, you know if you're having a, a new construction done uh, before your your uh, construction contractor is done, you should probably do your own inspection or or hire a consultant to go through and inspect and make sure that that all of these are met. Because the last thing you want, you know, I, and I'm not even sure I would trust government inspectors, uh, quite frankly. The other thing is that, you know, when things settle after a couple of years, you know, construction tends to settle a bit. Your parking lot, which was perfectly within specs when it was built, may tend to kind of sag out of spec. And you may need to think about, um, you know, getting it repaved or something like that to bring it into spec. I, I'm always surprised when I find a, a parking lot that's really bad um, because. There, you know, there's just no way it can be in compliance with the ADA when it's filled with potholes and whatnot. It, it's going to cause accessibility problems for people in wheelchairs. Uh, accessible doors. This one, I think the biggest one about accessible doors is that you need to have a you need to have a smooth kick plate on the side where you have to push, um, so that the so the wheelchair, uh, the the person in the wheelchair can can you know, kick that door open and, uh, and roll the wheelchair through. So that's a, that's a real big one that the, these specifications are super technical. If they find that you're, uh, and I, I've misspelled within wrong there, it's, it should be within, not within. Um, but you know, if they find it's nine and a half inches, you're, you know, you're technically in violation and you need to get that fixed. Um, and I'm, I'm going to skip through that. Those, you know, these are, these are, uh, you know, added requirements for, for accessible doors, but, you know, the, the biggest one, you know, well, they're all big, quite frankly, if they find a violation, that's a violation. Um, dining is a big one. Um, 5% of each functional area of the dining surfaces must be accessible. What do we mean by functional area? Well, from what I can figure out, it means if you have a bar, 5% of the bar needs to be accessible. So if you've got 20 seats, one of those seats has to be accessible. You might think about making two accessible in case, you know, the, the person in the wheelchair wants to eat with somebody else. Um, well, you know, but what do we mean by wheelchair accessible? Well, it's got to be low enough 
and they have pretty tight specs on, on you know, what's low enough. Uh, if you have indoor and outdoor uh, dining, your indoor and your outdoor dining both have to be at least 5% uh, compliant. So, you know, you'll see, you know, maybe in restaurants, you'll see even McDonald's will have booths that will have um, the wheelchair accessible, you know, they'll have at least some wheelchair accessible booths. Uh, again, that's to meet that requirement that, you know, each functional area has at least 5% uh, of the dining surfaces accessible. So here are some of the some of the requirements. Uh, your knee and toe spaces have to be at least 27 inches high. That means you know you've got enough clearance to pull that wheelchair up and uh, underneath the the surface at least 30 inches wide, so it's wide enough to get that wheelchair in there. At least 19 inches deep, so that the um, wheel wheelchair bound individual can get the you know can get the feet up underneath there and actually reach the surface. Um, the table and counter tops. So, you know, this, the 27 inches is to the bottom. Um, the, uh, the tops can, uh, can be, uh, from 28 to 34 inches from the ground or floor. So, while this is a minimum, uh, these maxima are like 34 inches is the maximum. And you probably want to want to shoot, you know, well between those two, you know, in order not to have problems. But, you know, so it, you know, talking with my, my ADA consultant friends, um, parking lots are a big problem. Dining areas are a big problem, not, not being, you know, having situations where a diner can't reach something, you know, say you've got ketchup packets. And you're sitting in a wheelchair and you can't reach up to grab ketchup packets because they're way up here. So, one of the things you need to think about is getting things down on a lower level so that anybody can anybody can reach them. Restrooms are 1 of the biggest problems um, and, and, I'll, and I'll show you 1 of the 1 of the uh, big problems as we go through here. You know, they're just hot spots that, um, and, and the way these folks work is, um, you know, because there's that attorney's fee there, that, that's sort of an incentive for attorneys to, uh, to get involved in these cases. And it was intended for that to be the case with the ADA. The, the drafters of the ADA felt that, um, it, that not enough people would take advantage of it. If there weren't an incentive for for lawyers to get involved, so the American rule of jurisprudence is that if you have a lawsuit between two individuals, they each pay their own attorney. Almost, you know, I would say ninety eight percent of the time. And there there are a few cases where fee shifting goes in place. Uh, that's usually because one of the parties behaved very badly during litigation. But the rule under the ADA is. There's there's a presumption that the uh, the defendant that would be the the violator or the business person, however you want to think about it, uh, is uh, is going to pay the the fees for the um, you know for the, the the disabled person who files the suit, unless it's just a completely unmeritorious suit. Which they rarely are. Uh, the ADA is fairly difficult to comply with, and it's fairly easy to find violations. So restrooms are a huge one. Uh, you know, they will send a person in a, in a wheelchair in. Uh, that person will go to use the restroom, find a violation, complain to the manager in order to get it documented, and then roll out and file a lawsuit. And they can <laughs> they hit an entire strip mall in an afternoon, um, or you know, you know, every restaurant in a, in a certain area, and and you know, just you know essentially rake in the dough at least that you know the lawyers will um and if there's a class action lawsuit then the defendant can end up making a, a good amount of money out of that as well um now here's some examples a unisex restroom must have a sign i don't know if you've ever seen this kind of sign around uh you might have thought as as i did at one time that, that had something to do with 
civil defense or something like that. That's actually the universal sign for a unisex bathroom. And you can see that it has uh, a, a partic particular characteristics to it. Um, you might not have thought about the fact that it was, a, you know, at least a 12 inch diameter uh, circle. In this case, it's a dark circle. It has to be, uh, if it's a dark circle, it has to be on a light background. If it's a light circle, it has to be in a dark background. Uh, then the, the triangle in the middle has to have the vertex at the, at, at the top. Um, and then there are all these other dimensional requirements for it. And, um, and if, if you don't see that on a unisex bathroom, it is technically out of violation or it out of that is technically a violation. And it has to be 58 to 60 inches above ground. If it's 62 inches above ground or 45 inches above ground, it's in violation. You can see how this, unless you're, you know, whoever puts the sign up is paying attention and knows the rules, you know, you can see that it's going to be easy to mess up. If it's on the door, it needs to be within one inch of the vertical center line of the door. Now, there are also bathrooms, and you've probably seen these at the, um, mostly I've seen them at the airport, where there's no door, there's just an entrance. You know, then you can put it over to the side, but it still has to be 58 to 60 inches above ground. Uh, here's some more requirements. And this, and, and believe me, this is just the, the tip of the iceberg. I haven't hit every particular thing, uh, but you know, now if we're, if let's say we have men's and women's bathrooms uh, demarcated, uh, there has to be a pictogram of, uh, you know, either male or female, or, or it could be both. Um, it needs to be sans serif, uh, uppercase lettering raised 132 inch, um, height of five eighths inch to two inches. Um, it has to have braille and a horizontal format. It has to be um, three eighths to one half inch below tactile characters, flush left or centered. You know, you can just see that these are, you know, these these are fairly technical. And you really have to be paying attention to the detail. They're really spelled out. So you know what you have, you know, if you go through all of these requirements, they're, they're very well spelled out, but they're also highly technical. And unless, unless the person who's installing these things, um, first off, knows to install them, and secondly, installs them properly, you can end up in a, with a violation. Um, so bathrooms, I've said here, uh, turning space complying with 304. So there's a section that refers to another section. I left this in here. I thought about kind of dumbing this down and taking it up. And I thought, you know, you should really know that there are places where in order to know what's what you're what you need to do to comply with one section, you need to go look at another section. So you can see that this thing gets a little recursive. It's a bit like following a, a complex computer program in a way. Um, anyhow, the, the section 304 says that uh, in you know, circular space has to have a 60 inch radius. You can also have a T-shaped space within a square and it has to have 30, at least 36 inches arms and base. And you have knee and toe space of at least 25 inches. So you can see, you know, they've, they've really tried to think through everything in order to make it so that it, you know, somebody in a wheelchair can get in. And, and what they're normally, and this is what they're normally concerned with. This is what they're normally concerned with. It, with accessibility is just imagine somebody in a wheelchair that certainly there are other people who have uh, who have disabilities other than wheelchair bound people but most of these if you look at most of these requirements uh, they are they, they're trying to help people who have mobility problems that are confined to a wheelchair or to you know some sort of a, a motorized scooter or something like that um then they they specify how the door should swing you know it shouldn't swing into the clear floor space or clearance required for any fixture if you if you go into a compliant unisex bathroom for instance you, you've noticed that they're rather large okay you know, a lot of people use them exclusively because they are large and it just gives them more room to move around well guess what that's there for a reason um the, the door may swing into some required clear space Okay, uh, here's a big one. This was this one bites a lot of people. Um, 
The bottom edge must be no more than 40 inches above the finished floor if above the sink or 35 inches above the finished floor if not above the sink. Now, to be honest with you, I don't understand why there should be a difference there. If it has to be 35 inches, if there's no sink, then why doesn't it, you know, bleh. anyhow, that's the rule. If it's a full length mirror, it should have a top at least 74 inches high for tall people. Now, here's the thing. You don't have to have a mirror. So the, the solution that a lot of people have found is when they get hit with a complaint that their mirror is non-compliant or they just get a cons you know, consultation that their mirror is non-compliant. They just take the mirror. So, you know, I'm not sure we're helping people very much here, but that's, that's the situation. Uh, and then I, I, again, here code hooks within ranges specified in 308. I thought about kind of going through and, and going through the 308 requirements here. Uh, it would take too long and, and I don't think you would remember it anyhow. So suffice it to say that there are different requirements for different situations. And in fact, it, it underscores a, a point, you know, that, that I'm going to make a little bit, uh, farther on, but I may as well just mention it here that. When you have code hooks and ledges and, and you know, shelves to, to put things on, again, they're mostly concerned about somebody sitting in a wheelchair and having to reach up and, and grab something or reach over and grab something. The idea is to put it within arm's reach of a, of a you know, normal adult human being. And um, if you put yourself in that mindset, you'll, you'll be you'll be pretty far down the road to figuring these things out when they, you know, when they require that, well, if it's in this size space or if it's, you know, if there's a, let's say there's a um, counter here and there's a shelf here, well, the counter can't be any more than 10 inches deep and it can't be more than a, you know, a, a reach of 44 inches or something like that. And I, I just made those numbers up, but, um, that's what they're getting at here. And so that, you know, that's the mindset you need to be in when you're, when you're going through these things. Um, let's see again, shells, 40 inches, max 48, uh, that kind of thing. Um, there's a lot of stuff about what the water closet has to be. Water closet is the place where the, you know, the, the separate partitioned area for a toilet. Um, it needs to have a uh, have a wall or partition to the rear of the side, and it has to be at least. It needs to have a center line that's uh, 16 to 18 inches from the side wall or partition. Why? Because it's got to have a grab rail on it, and you, you got to be able to reach over and grab that grab rail in order to to stand up or move around. Um, clearance. Um, you have to have 60 inches minimum side to side, 56 inches front to back. You need to have grab bars. Again, they have to comply with section 6 and 9. That's another section. It's a rather long one and, uh, and it's rather complicated, but, um, but, it, but it is, I mean, it's understandable. It's just, it would be a lot to put on a, a slide. Um, let me just talk a little bit about, you know, I've talked about all the negative stuff. Let me talk about some, some positives. Um, there are tax incentives, you know, to comply with the ADA. Um, depending on the size of your business, you may get tax credits, tax deductions, or both. Um, and, and my suggestion is to you, and this is just a general suggestion for taxes. I, this is how much I know about taxes. I took one semester of tax law in, uh, in law school. Okay, so I don't know much about tax law. It changed one, two things I know. Uh, number one, the law changes every year. So you have to, you know, you really have to be up on what's going on every year. And number two, um, if you're like me, get somebody else to do your taxes. Those are the two things I know about tax law. Uh, but, you know, check, check yearly on this kind of thing, but, um, businesses, small businesses, 30 or fewer employees can get a tax credit. 
how large is that tax credit? I don't know. You know, check with your tax preparer if you use um, you know, if you use a tax preparation program, check with them. Um, tax, you can also get tax deductions for expenses. Uh, these may or may not be in addition to just normal, ordinary uh, tax deductions. So uh, those are, you know, they, they, the, the federal government tries to help you out. And there may be state and local tax incentives as well. So, you know, yes, it's expensive. Yes, it's a pain in the neck. Yes, there are predatory attorneys out there, predatory uh, plaintiffs. That said, um, you know, the ADA is 30 years old. So there's kind of a general uh, expectation that people will comply with it. Um, and, and you do have some incentives to do so. So here are some, here are some suggestions for compliance. And these are after talking with uh, again friends who are in the uh, who are in the business of, of consulting uh, on ADA compliance. Um, but one is just perform a self audit, and these are fairly easy to do. You get the you, you get the the rules. Well, here here's a starter. Um, rent a wheelchair or get a friend who is wheelchair bound. And um, and either you yourself or have your friend uh, wheel through your establishment and try to access everything that you would expect a normal customer to access. And then note the places where they have problems. If your parking lot is out of spec, it more than two percent grade, or your ramp is too too steep, they'll let you know. And, um, and, you know, you should make note of that and you should put that down on your, on your punch out list for, for fixing. Um, if they have trouble getting in your front door, if they have trouble accessing any of the, you know, if you're running a restaurant, if they're having trouble accessing your condiments or they're having trouble accessing drinks or, uh, you know, whatever self-serve items you might have there, then, um, and then by all means that, you know, note those things. Pay a special attention to the bathroom. If they have any accessibility problems in the bathroom, they have trouble getting into it, turning around, using the commode, uh, you know, getting back out, washing their hands, opening the door, et cetera, et cetera, then you should note those things. Uh, these are these are important things for you to do. And the nice thing about doing it yourself or having some, you know, some friend do it for you is, you know, they'll be honest with you or you can be honest with yourself and, and you can spot a lot of problems before they actually come to the attention of one of these predatory plaintiffs or lawyers. And you can probably fix a lot of things simply by, uh, you know, making some, you know, some changes to the layout of your of your establishment. And I noticed one restaurant that my wife and I um, go to a lot, they recently moved things down lower. Now I'm guessing they got a complaint, they got an ADA complaint from somebody. Uh, but I noticed that they they changed the way they, you know, they they used to have cups in these uh, cup holders that went like practically up to the roof. And you know, I stand five six on my TP dose. And, um, and, and, you know, it, it wasn't a horrible reach for me, but, you know, I had to reach to get the top one. I'm thinking, well, somebody in a wheelchair is not going to be able to get those. So that's, um, and that's a problem. They shouldn't have to, uh, come to the, the, you know, the front counter and wait to be waited on to get a cup when everybody else can go and grab one. So you need to think about it in those terms. Um, because believe me, these you know these serial plaintiffs and predatory lawyers will. Um, you can arrange for a professional audit. You should especially do this if you get a complaint. Somebody comes and has to talk to the manager. They're in a wheelchair. Um, you, your first call should be your lawyer. Your and your lawyer's first call should be to one of these uh, professionals. 
but before you you get that that complaint it, it probably makes sense especially if you're in an older building um, just arrange for a professional to come out i guarantee you it'll be cheaper in the end than than you know not doing anything because you will get sued it's just a matter of time you know it's it's like the worst uh reverse lotto you can imagine uh if you are sued don't try to get out of it yourself okay you you know it's like like i tell everybody just lawyer up you know um but this is especially true if you get sued you get a if you get a letter from a from a lawyer lawyer up uh, let things. I know you're thinking, oh, it'll get expensive. It's already gotten expensive. If you if you get that letter, it's gotten expensive. So you're now in. Try to keep the expense reasonable. Land, uh, you're you're past the. I, I'm going to do this on the cheap, land. It, that's way in your rearview mirror. Um. You. This remediation plan, I have it here under if you get sued. Um, you're definitely going to want a remediation plan if you get sued. It'd be nice if you already had it in place. It'd be great if you had that professional audit done. And, you know, you, you or, or even if you did a self audit and you had a remediation plan, at least then you've got some sort of, um, you've got something to say, look, you know, your honor, yeah, we know we've got some problems, but this is an older building and we're, we've been working on it. And look, we're, you know, we're six items into our 10 item uh, punch out list. And, um, and you know, we, we plan to address these other four, you know, on, on the following time schedule. And, uh, you know, and the court may say, well, you know, we really think you should accelerate that, but, but, you know, you've tried hard and stuff. So, you know, um, you know, no damages, yay, and uh, you know, uh, yeah, you don't have to pay the attorney's fees. Something like that, maybe. In any case, your your situation is going to be better if you've already got that in place. But if you don't have it in place before you get sued, you definitely are going to want to have it in place after you get sued. You know, in the order you want to go in, so you want to hire your lawyer and let your lawyer get the consultant. Now. Before you get sued, before you have a complaint lodged, the best thing is do a self audit to, to kind of spot any really big issues at the UCF, and then hire a professional to come in and kind of clean up where you may have missed some things. Okay. Because there are going to be all sorts of technical things that you didn't think about that probably aren't that important, but they're the kind. You, you probably would have caught most of the worst ones with the self audit, but the professional audit's going to catch all the technical ones that that will, that you know will come and bite you if you get one of these predatory attacks. Okay, so that's all I have for this uh, for this topic. Um, if I've offended anybody with my terminology, you know, predatory. Uh, this or you know that um first off if i offend any lawyers sorry um <laughs> sort of uh if i've offended anybody else i really am sorry i, I don't mean to uh, offend anybody uh the ada is it's very important uh it was adopted for very good reasons it was uh, championed by bob dole who i respect very very much who himself had disabilities and um and and it rose above them and, um, you know, I, I hope everybody takes this seriously because the consequences of not, and not just because it's the right thing to do, which it obviously is, but uh, because if you don't, it can really, it can really harm your business. So um, I'm going to stop sharing now, if that's okay, Julie. And uh, yes, thank you so much. That was really informative. You know, like I had mentioned before, we don't know what we don't know. People just don't know. So um, it was. If you sharing that, um, I'm sure a lot of people got a lot of information out of this. Um, if you missed some of the webinar, you want to go back, you want to refer it to a friend, just as I say every week, we record these and you can go back and find them on YouTube on the City of Surprise Economic Development page. So um, if you missed any of Matt's awesome series, they're all stored there for waiting for you to watch. 
So we actually are not having a webinar next week um, on Tuesday. It's spring break week. Uh, but we will be back on the 23rd, I believe, um, talking about. Um, yeah, the ADA is applied to the internet. Yeah. Yes, which is crazy. I, I'm really, I'm excited to hear about that because I would have no idea how that would even pertain to anything. So um, anyway, I look forward to seeing you on the 23rd and I hope everyone has an awesome week and thank you. All right. Thank you, Julie. See you. Okay, see you on the 23rd. Right. Bye. Bye. Have a good spring break.